at the base of the needle. They're not on the needle itself. And then the oak skeletonizer is a little moth that gets in there. It just caused, once again, it's a needle damage thing. <coughs> so here's, this is, the trees around here don't look like this yet, except for one tree that I saw over in Seneca Lake. This is about three, four years into the infestation. You can see the needles are, are beginning to turn yellow and fall off, and there really is very little uh, extension. Well, here's one active extension. Uh, very few buds forming at the ends. Um, when you look at the trees, you get a yellowing of the crown, you get the crown decreasing in uh, density, like this, thinning out, <coughs> and gradually declining until death. I mean, there are a lot of hemlocks around here that look sort of sickly, um, and I have a number of theories about it. Uh, uh, root rot might be one of them, is one of them. Uh, but really, the way to identify the adelgid is not by looking from back. You've got to get right up close to it and look underneath it and see those dots underneath. Um, so, what can we do now? <laughs> After you identify it, you've got to survey. You've got to delimit the area, extent of the infestation, see how, <coughs> see how uh, intense it is, and then uh, yeah, see how intense it is, level of infestation. Um, and then what you can do is, if you've got pet trees and you've got enough money, you can treat them and save them. Uh, you need to be well aware of the proximity to streams and consider non-treatment as an option. We do have time. It takes a while to kill the tree. And if it really comes down to it, you can wait a couple of years and see what's, see what's happening. But it's going to start spreading from that spot. Um, and you've got to know your liabilities. I mean, you have a dead tree on your property, you've got to get rid of it so it doesn't fall over and hit somebody on the head. Uh, you've got to look at a budget, identify personnel, and you know, where you, who you're going to get to do the work. Um, these issues are very important also with the emerald ash borer that will be coming here. If you have ash trees on your property, be aware of where they are and your liabilities. If you have a big ash tree in your backyard right now, I would start saving some money because you're going to need to be removing it sometime soon. And it's a big It's already deal. dying from something else. It's already dying? Oh, the, no, the ash tree is already dying from, from, the, ash, the, from the ash yellows. Yeah, yeah, before the other little bug. Right. Oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 the ash tree. I mean, the emerald. When the emerald ash borer moves through, it's going to be moving through rather quickly. Um, so, and research. We're looking right now at cold temperatures, trying to determine if we really do have a, bio, a biotype up here that's unique from the others, that's going to actually start spreading beyond the lakes and into the upland forests or the hemlocks. And biological control. We've got to start now for biocontrol. I mean, it's going to take, I'll be lucky if it's established by the, by the time I pass away. Um, but I sure hope it is. We've got to get it going now. So, what you can do, this website, this is the New York Invasive Species Research Institute website. Uh, we have a form up there for if you see it, we want to know it. And also, if you don't see it, I want to know that as well. So we wear, know where people have already looked. Um, right now, this is, if we can get most of these big stands around here inspected before it becomes hard in the summertime, uh, th that's going to be a really big deal. I mean, Right now, I'm trying. Just I'm looking at it, trying to figure out which are the most important stands to look at, and I'll be talking to Todd about that. Um, for instance, I just trained some people last week in, in uh, uh, the Finger Lakes National Forest, and they went to Watkins Glen and found it there. So Watkins Glen State Park has it now. We found it at the Finger Lakes National Forest. Uh, there's a no number of places we haven't found it too. I was just up at uh, Fillmore Glen. So it's really, this, is, this is the critical time, I think, to understand, to get that baseline information so we know where it is and what we're dealing with, really. And so when we go forward, we can look back and say, oh, this is how that happened. So um, that being said, are there any questions? Is anybody still awake? <laughs> <laughs> I'll start over here. Yes, um, like one of the first slides you showed um, of the lakes and gorges with the, the, it was a woman from the East who said. Who had looked at it, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it was just so glaringly around the lakes and the gorges <coughs> and not anywhere else. Um, did she only focus there? She focused on the lakes because of the temperature issue. And we've always felt that the temperatures up here were too cold. 
to support populations. But we've always had the hankering of an idea that if it does get established next to the lakes, they'll probably get going, and hence they have. Um, how extensively have people looked for it? Um, like from the Portland area. I'm just, you know, I'm always looking and seeing the river. Well, I was just like, over in Skinny Atlas yesterday. It's not in some areas near Skinny Atlas and in Bear Swamp that I was at. Uh -huh. uh, I've looked up at Shindagan Hollow uh, in a number of areas uh, that are higher and colder, and I haven't found it yet. But that doesn't mean it can't go there. That's why we're doing that temperature research. Yes? Yeah, continuation on that. I noticed for Cayuga Lake, it looked like all the points were on the west side of the lake. Mm -hmm. Was that, was that, did they look on both sides or was that just because they looked over there and, it, and so the, 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 the uh, east side hasn't been surveyed? Good point. Uh, I talked, I talked to them about that. It was, it was really the place that they, they could get to easily by car and know that they could, didn't have to get landowner permission and, yeah. and actually one of the sites that we're going to target with the volunteer monitoring that we'll be switching gears to here in, in a minute is going to be doing, is going to be looking at some of those east side sites. Yeah, she, she didn't really get everywhere and she tried. Um, and uh, it really was related basically to her access and how it was limited. Um, so the survey is not complete, not by any stretch of the imagination. And she didn't have enough time. <coughs> she didn't get to Owasco Lake, she didn't get to Skinny Atlas Lake, or she, and she didn't get to Otisco Lake either. Uh, Gary? Um, is there any, I noticed you didn't mention anything about uh, trimming branches in the early stages or possibly even cutting trees down. Is that even feasible? Yes, it is feasible. In the winter time, it's like once, once the crawlers settle, they're not going anywhere. So in the winter time, if you want to cut down all the infested hemlocks on your property and burn them, or, you know, or, you know basically, I don't know if they would complete development and lay eggs on a tree that was just laying on the ground. I don't know of any research that's done that. I know the DEC in Rochester actually, they got, uh, there was an infestation up there, they treated just like that. They cut down all the trees in the, in the winter time and they took it to a uh, uh, landfill disposal site and Jerry says that he thinks that they were training the guys how to dig holes deep and they, they <laughs> dug these holes down 60 feet deep and they threw the trees in and they covered it up. So anyway, that's how, that's how they did it. I don't know. You know, it's like you could burn them if you have a, a, a you know, burn pile or something. That would be an option. It would be a lot cheaper than digging deep holes. But, uh, but yes, it is. Um, you mentioned in the soil injection method that you have to be careful how close you are to water sources, uh, streams, for example. How close is close enough to be concerned about. I mean, we're talking about 50 feet to uh, this is, this 200 is feet or what? This is Todd's we, we've, been, we've been researching this, um, and it is a really a, a lot of very site-dependent characteristics. Um, the slope of the land, uh, the distance, the uh, content of organic matter, the imidacloprid binds readily to organic matter. And so, if the area's got a lot of, of uh, organic matter, then it, the emitted culprit won't travel as far off target. Uh, if it's very rocky, which a lot of our sites are, it'll travel further. Um, I, I, I contacted the National Park Service that spoke about National Park to ask them that, because that's, this is what they've been doing, and I figured, why, why reinvent the wheel? And based on some of their information, it looked like uh, you know, at least 50, maybe 100 feet from the edge of the water um, it is a rule of thumb, um, which you know is, is many of the uh, areas that we have, the hemlocks, that's where they're, they're growing. So that's one, mm -hmm. why, why it's one of the more problematic issues that we have about limited um, treatment options. Um, so it, it really depends on, on a lot of, a lot of uh, factors, so it's not just a, a simple, straightforward answer, unfortunately. Especially since the gullies, some of them have such a steep ditch where all those uh, There's that, and, and, and we really didn't talk too much about the timing of the metacloprid uh, application. It's, it's supposed to be when the uh, hemlock is, is actively transporting through, through the tree, and so that'll be, you know, March, April, 
which is when you get a lot of rain, <laughs> you get snow melt. Uh, you know, so all, all of those things are working in, in uh, uh, opposite direction of, of um, you know, the concerns about it, it transporting off-site. And the other thing is, too, a lot of these gorge walls have natural seepages. And the water is, is, is emptying out and going down. Um, so it, it's, it's really a, a series of unfortunate uh, factors that are, that are making that treatment more problematic than what they've seen in other hemlock stands that 